So, Gail, welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to turn it over to you now. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you to all of the people who are here. I'm, I'm amazed at the, the response. This is great on a Sunday night. Thanks so much for joining me. Um, this is a technique. I call it the Windows technique, and um, I dreamed this up a bunch of years ago, and I've worked it through in different iterations, and in fact, I even worked it into a... Um, a bound buttonhole class that I did at ASG when we did it in Florida in the Orlando area. So this is a technique that's really versatile for a lot of things. And um, the thing that's nice to know about this is that you can do it on clothing, quilts, um, bags. You'll see one on my um, tote bag pretty soon. And um, home decor, anything that you want to do. So it is versatile for all kinds of sewing. So um, now I'm going to be very brave, uh, Cheryl, and try to share my screen. I just wanted to show before we go to the machine, I'm going to do um, a, a demo of how to stitch around the circle and give you some tips for how to get a really smooth arc, even on a small circle. The one I'm doing, the circle I'm doing tonight is about the size of a quarter. So it's small. And, um, but I'm going to show you some examples of ones that I have. So let's hope that this works again. We, we uh, had a little hiccup earlier, but I think we'll be okay. Okay. So, and oops, what happened? Uh, I'm going to minimize this. Yes, here we go. Okay. And Command L, let's see if we can get this full screen. Okay, I don't know why this is breaking down a little bit, but that's on a um, gray sweatshirt fleece knit. It might just be the quality of it. This one I did actually as a buttonhole and I did hand stitching, three lines of hand stitching, just a running stitch around it that matched the button that went in it. That's on black fabric, that's why it looks so dark. This one is on the neckline of um, a top I call the halo top. And um, it's got this pretty neckline. I'll pull it out to the next one. Here it is on a navy blue knit. So it works well on both knits and wovens. It doesn't matter which one you do. Um, this one has a little charm in the middle. And I have one that's very similar to it that I'll show you how to attach. And these are little crystals, little beads that I did around the edge of that. And it's pretty because it's almost like built-in jewelry. These are just some samples that I have. Um, these outside buttons, these rhinestones are antique ones. And um, I had those, this one was a button. It's a newer one that I bought when I was in New York one day. I thought that was kind of pretty. And you can see it's caught by hand stitching to each one. And if you didn't want your hand stitching to show up, uh, you could always use something like um, one of the um, clear threads or uh, a lighter color that might not show, like a white might disappear more easily. This is one on a skirt that I have, and I think I've got another shot of this. And um, what I did on this was I bought these beads actually at an ASG, um, show that uh, or a conference that had somebody who was um, a bead um, vendor. And as soon as I saw them, I love them. And I said, I'm going to make something out of uh, brown linen. And what I like to show on this one, particularly while we're here, is that I just chose a decorative stitch that's built into my machine. And you can see how it kind of echoes the motif that's on the bead itself. So it gives it some nice um, cohesiveness to the design. And I have these three little beads on the side that hold it onto uh, the fabric edge. This is another one, this is a, a green linen. And um, I just did beading around the perimeter of the um, window all by hand. This one is on a black jacket. These are Swarovski crystals in this. And I have another shot of another crystal. And this was done, oh, a bunch of years back, but um, it's 
um, a line jacket. This is a, a crystal as well, a Swarovski crystal. I just thought it was so pretty and I loved it. But here's a square window. So you can do basically any shape you want. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. This is my unbeweavable technique that's going through the uh, weaving of the fabric. Here is the um, line side of that circular crystal you saw two slides back. And I always say I must have had way too much time on my hands that summer because um, what I had to do was kind of based in the lining, find exactly where the window was and then create another window on the lining itself. And this is a black Bember gray on that I just discharged the dye with a Clorox bleach pen. And then I drizzled um, some water-based um, fabric inks on it just to get a kind of a fun effect. Oh, we're back to this one. Okay, so, um, oh, this one uh, is again on a linen and I beaded it around the inside of the, the perimeter of the window, a little bit of beading outside. This dark disc on the inside is just a plain old button. And what I did was before I attached it to the window, I drizzled some super glue on it and then just sprinkled these little beads on. So it wasn't anything that was difficult to do at all, but it, I think it's kind of a pretty effect. Um, this is a close-up of one with a reverse applique on the inside. This is, again, that gray sweatshirt fleece. I did some stamping and some hand beading around the perimeter of that. This is a, um, a gray uh, jacquard silk that I got in Vietnam. Oh, and here's the um, hem of that skirt, just to show you. And that's the shaped hem um, template with the stepped hem on it. So I think that brings us back. Yes, it does. So I am going to stop sharing the screen. Were there any questions about that at all? Um, I'm not seeing anything in the chat. And so I think there must not be any questions. Um, OK, so, so I'm back. All right, so um, the first thing that you want to do, now I like to use a fusible interfacing for this technique, but you can use a lining fabric, you can use a self fabric as long as it's not too heavy, um, whatever works well for you. But I kind of like using a fusible interfacing. I use Denny Fuse, and um, it's a lightweight fusible interfacing. You can see it's it's very light. And what I've done for making kits is I stamp on the size of the circle that I want people to stitch around. And that's the one that we're going to use tonight. But the thing that's nice about the interfacing is that it stabilizes that whole area and strengthens it. But if I were going to do it on a super lightweight fabric, like a very lightweight knit or um, a, even like a silk, something like that, I wouldn't do it on anything that has any transparency or sheerness to it because you would see all the back work on it and it wouldn't be attractive. But if you're doing something on a very lightweight fabric, I might even put a, a piece of interfacing on the back of the fabric itself and then use it again to um, create the window. So um, that's the first thing. So you're going to draw your shape on the fusible side of the interfacing. And I've got, I've got this under my um, needle, but before we start, I've got this all pinned on. And the fusible side is face up. Let me just get that in the center. Fusible side is face up so that um, when we go to the back, we'll be able to fuse it as we turn it. And you want to keep your shape pretty simple. I know when I first started doing this, I thought, oh, I think I'll do a hexagon. And I did stitch around it, and um, the stitching was easy. That wasn't hard. But when I turned the interfacing to the inside, all it looked like was a really bad circle. So I would say keep your shapes like squares, rectangles, circles, triangles, something like that. But I wouldn't try to get into anything too intricate on a small scale. If you were going bigger on a larger project, you definitely probably could and get a very nice um, uh, finished product. But on something that is the scale of something you'd wear on a jacket or a skirt or something like that, I'd keep the shape pretty pretty simple. 
So um, maybe we should go to the um, machine. I'm going to give you a few of my settings. Um, I am going to do a straight stitch. And I have my stitch length. I'm going to do it on a linen, 100% linen. So it's, you know, it's a, not a heavy fabric at all, but it's not sheer either. I have my stitch length on 2.0. And if you have an auto pivot feature where when you take your foot off the foot control, the presser foot lifts a couple of millimeters, engage it because you're going to be pivoting and turning your fabric. And also, if your machine has the feature that allows you to lighten your presser foot pressure, definitely do that. I brought mine down to one. I think it, mine has a one, two, three setting. So I lowered it as low as I could go. And that just makes it easier to move the fabric as the machine is stitching. So um, those are some of my... Um, best tips. Also, you don't want to back stitch or lock stitch. You're just going to overlap maybe one stitch because there won't be any stress on the um, stitching line at all after it's all fused to um, the back. So I think I will switch cameras. And Gail, while you're yeah. switching cameras, it has just, I've just received a text that tells me that the chat function is not working so um what we'll do instead is um when you want questions i will go with the i see some people have raised their hand their blue hand if you raised your blue hand to tell me that the chat function was not working if you'll lower your hand and that way i'll use the blue hands to let me know that someone actually has a question so we're that's something we're going to have to learn how to fix before the next one. So, okay. all right. So, um, did, did we want to take any questions before we start stitching? It looks like everybody's lowering their blue hand. Okay. I believe so. Um, there. Uh, why don't you go ahead? I think there's two that are left up, but I think they may just still be trying to lower their hand. So go ahead, and we'll take questions when you're ready. Okay, and um, please ignore the three. As I said, um, this is a stamp that I use when I do this in class, and I do three different size windows. And so just to make it easy for people, I had the numbers put in, because um, I'd say take, take the piece of interfacing with number one, number two, or number three. So ignore that. That doesn't have anything to do with anything tonight. So... Um, I put on my clear open toe foot and I even cleaned it before I, um, I came on because it had, was kind of gunked up with uh, adhesive. And I'm not sure why this is doing this with the um, exposure. Let me just see if I can. Is that good for you? I think it's good. Yeah. Okay. Looks all right, so I have my clear foot on, and that's so that I can easily follow the line of the circle. And I just lower my needle right into that line, put my presser foot down, and I've got my um, auto pivot open. And um, as I go around, uh, you'll see me stop every two or three stitches because the whole key to getting a really nice um, arc on this, a smooth one, is to stop a uniform number of stitches as you go along. And it's, it sounds kind of tedious, and it, it is a little bit, but um, it's quick, and as you do it, you'll get better and better, and that allows you to pivot the fabric around. So let's give it a go. There's my auto pivot. So what I want to do is always keep the line of the arc in front of my needle. That's what's important. So I'm stopping every three stitches and turning that circle just a little bit. One, two, three. And just keeping that arc straight ahead.
you can see it's pretty easy. You just have to kind of take your time, be a little bit patient, but you'll be very happy with your results if you do kind of take your time. Coming down to the home stretch, one, two, just turn it a little more. Okay, now I'm going to go one stitch and I'm going to overlap one. So now I can come up. I'm going to cut my thread. Okay, and I mentioned um, to Cheryl that uh, before we went on that uh, I was a little bit concerned about being in a small area with uh, my little camera and the computer and everything and an iron. So what I did was step outs. So you can see that this is all stitched and I used a bright green thread on that. Hopefully you can see it. Um, so it's all stitched out. Here's what the backside looks like. Just like that. And then the next step is you're going to cut out your circle. And it's almost like a facing. You're gonna cut, I usually leave about, oh, maybe an eighth inch seam allowance or so. And then with sharp scissors, and it does pay to have sharp scissors, clip your little curves all the way around. And mine are clipped quite a few times to get a nice curve. And then you're just going to push your interfacing right through your window to the wrong side, let me, Put it right down here so you can see this a little bit. But Gail, if you could move to the left just a little bit, you might be a little bit more in the center of the camera. Thank Is that you. better? Sure. Better. Thank you. Okay, so now we pulled it to the wrong side of the um, main fabric, and this is what it's going to look like from the outside until we iron it. And um, one thing I will say about pressing with fusible interfacing is check your temperature on your iron before you press it because I know I've done this at um, different events and sometimes the irons in the room get super hot and it will actually melt some of the interface things. So you wanna be careful of that. But what you're going to do is, let me just move this forward again so you can see it. What you're going to do is as you press, you're going to pull back on that interfacing and use the tip of the iron and do what I call a brushing motion. Take the tip and brush it out around the perimeter. And I just fuse the very edge of the interfacing first. And then I flip it to the right side to take a look at it. And if I see any of the interfacing peeking out, I'll just reheat it and pull it back a little bit more. So once that um, edge is all fused, you've checked it and it looks really nice, then you can just hit the whole piece of interfacing with your iron and press. And if you have a press cloth, that's a best practice too, so that you don't have a problem with melting it and um, marring your fabric at all. So this is what it would look like all pressed, which is really a nice finish. And you don't see any of that interfacing from the right side. Let's flip it over. And one thing I want to show you, and I'm kind of glad it happened, was I got a little wrinkle on the interfacing when I hit the whole thing with my iron, let me just bring it over here. Is that better with that white on it, Cheryl? Yeah, you can see it. Okay, well, I got a little wrinkle on the um, interfacing, but would I bother to reheat it and pull it out? No, because let's take a look at it from the right side. You don't see it at all. It's right up in here. So it isn't worth um, taking a chance of doing anything that might distort the fabric or the shape of your window. So that's the start for this technique. Now, um, I also like to use that with reverse applique. And I, when I do the workshops, I always try to find some kind of a fun, bold print because, I, and I cut them fairly large. Oh, that's another thing. When you're cutting your interfacing, before I go to that, cut a big enough piece to hold because sometimes if you've got a tiny little piece that's only 
um, a half an inch around, you're going to burn your fingers as you press it. So you can always trim away the excess, but if you've got something to hang on to without burning your fingers with the tip of your iron, that's even better. So, and actually you can see all the clips in here too, as, as it's all pressed out. So that's kind of a, a good example of all the clips that I did put in it. But going back to using it for a window with a reverse applique, I do try to find fabrics with kind of an interesting bold print with a lot of different colors because you could put that up here. You could bring it down here. Let me bring it over here. You could, let's find some other colors that we can get into. Here's some orange up here up here. So if you find something with a lot of different colors, um, it's kind of fun to play around with it and find something that you like that's pleasing and will go with your um, actual project. So it's pretty easy. And um, what you can do with that is you can uh, machine stitch around if you wanted to do a hand running stitch or select a decorative stitch, a built-in decorative stitch, or a zigzag even to go around, all of those will work very well. So um, it's kind of fun to use that as a, a reverse applique uh, opportunity too. So that makes that kind of fun. But how did I do the charm? Well, this is the same charm that you saw. I'm going to bring this over so that it's kind of on a, whoops, that's a little low on a plain part of the um Gail, machine. before you move to the charm, would it be a, a good time to take, we have three questions. Would it be a good time for that? Or would you, would you rather prep with the charm first? Nope, let's take some questions. All right, so because we can't, uh, so I'm gonna unmute Bonnie. Let me, Bonnie, uh, I believe you, nope, try again. Okay, Bonnie, uh, if you have been unmuted. Ask your question. Is that Bonnie in San Jose? Yes, hi, Bonnie. Okay, hi. Uh, I think you've answered it, but it's the right side of the fabric and the, the excuse me, the fusible part of the interfacing is up when you're stitching. So when you turn it, then you're fusing it all together. Exactly correct. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll go back on mute. Good, you're Great. paying very good attention. All right, and um, it looks like we also have a question from Bonnie. I think, let me see if I've got you unmuted, not yet. There we go, Vani. You. Uh, what was your stitch size that you were using to stitch that circle? I didn't catch that. Um, now on the linen, I used a 2.0 stitch length, and that really depends on the fabric that you've selected. If you are using a heavier, thicker fabric, um, you might want to go up a little bit, but I wouldn't go much beyond 2.5. And this is a technique that really is better for a smoother type of fabric. If you have something like a boucle, would it work as well? I don't think so. Um, so anything that's super dense, um, you might want to, or has an irregular uh, surface to it, bumpy or nubby, like boucles, uh, you might want to think about a different, um, a different technique to use on that. But this one was 2.0. All right, um, we've got another question from um, Julie, and I can see Julie V-A-R, Julia V-A-R, I can see that much on my screen. Um, uh, Julie, yes. you are unmuted. After you have cut the opening and clipped the seam, could you understitch the seam to the fusible interfacing like you would a facing before like you, you you see, you see. Um, you could, um, you, it depends on the size window you're doing. Now on something like this, where I, you probably want to leave a bigger seam allowance too, but um, you could, you could, uh, it might take a little work, but that's the beauty of the fusible interfacing is that it really does, um, it doesn't require that. 
to stay looking good. All right, and we've got another question from another Julia. And uh, let me, un and I'm only gonna take this question and one more, then I'm gonna let Gail get started again before we um, take the, any more questions. And I'm having trouble unmuting Julia. Let me try again. There we go, Julia. Hi. Hi. I'm just one. I'm just wondering at what stage, if you're putting this on a garment, uh, at what stage do you decide where you're going to put it? And and you obviously, I guess, would have to do it after you cut out that piece where the well, where the, yeah. Actually, Julia, um, that's something I have a little lecture that I do sometimes called "I Know How to Do It, But Where Do I Put It." Yeah. And um, what I like to do is really I put on the garment if it's a, if I'm wearing a garment and um, if or I should say if I'm going to do that technique on a garment and um, I put it I pin little circles for where it's going to be placed because there are some very obvious places say on a jacket or top that you wouldn't want a hole in your fabric. But, um, and I like things that, um, I don't like to have them down at the waistline if you're, if you've got on a pair of pants or you're wearing a belt, because I think if you don't have a reverse applique in back of it and you're going to see through that window, I think it's kind of disruptive to see like a, a blouse or a top and a belt and then maybe the top of your pants peeking through or top of a skirt and I also don't love putting them on um like on the center back of anything only because it kind of looks like a bullseye so I do I do my placement I'll cut out little um paper circles and pin them and take a look at it and I'll look at it on my body but then I'll put it on a dress form or a hanger and take a look to see if I like the composition too especially if I'm doing multiples all right Gail why don't you go ahead and talk about the the next part we do have more questions but I want to make sure that we let you talk a little bit more and then we'll take some more questions Okay, well, I had this um, idea when I first started doing these about putting uh, a charm or some beads or a button into the center of a window. And the very first time I tried it with a charm, I put it in just like this and I struggled mightily with trying to hand stitch it on and keep it exactly where I wanted to. Um, and I apologize for my, my um, focus going kind of in and out like that. I'm not sure why it's doing that. But anyway, um, I struggled with that. And then after I had it all stitched onto the edge of the fabric, I had this um, idea, of course, it comes to you afterwards. I thought, why don't I just stabilize it with a piece of tape? So what I do, and again, in workshops, I hand, hand it out, I will take a piece of tape, just regular old scotch tape, and I will put it across the back side, the wrong side of the window, just like this, and it's temporary. And the sticky side is showing through the window. And then I place my charm exactly where I want it to be. And it stays put. Now you could have it off center like that. You could put it directly in the center. You can do it horizontally. Let me just see if I can get this. Well, that's not quite in the center, but close enough, I guess. But um, I kind of like them off center too. I think it's kind of interesting looking. So, um, but the scotch tape holds it, like I can pick it up and then you can hand stitch it on with just taking a thin little needle and you need some spots to anchor it with some holes like uh, around the edge of the charm or even if you have a button that has, um, uh, the four holes in it or even two you can do it with that also and just anchor it to the side and what I learned was that um, if you wanted it, the thread to disappear you could use a monofilament as I said before or you can make it bold with a contrasting fabric or thread I should say 
and um, bring it through. And the thing you want to be careful of is that when you're attaching it to the very edge of the fabric, don't pull your stitches too tight because then it will um, make the, the circle pucker or your square or rectangle, whatever you had for the shape. So you just want to find a happy medium where it's attached with a stitch that's loose enough so that it's not messy looking, but not too tight where it might pucker the fabric as well. So that was my, my easy fix to that. But if you even wanted to do that with beading or charm and add that reverse applique in the back of it, how pretty is that? Let me just bring that up a little bit. So there are a lot of different things that you can do with this and um, make it look very nice. So. It's, uh, as I say, it's a fun technique. It's pretty easy to do. And even though it's a little bit fussy with stitching around, you can see that within a minute I was done. So um, there's nothing overly tricky about the whole thing. Did we have any other questions? Yes, ma'am, we do. So okay. uh, we, um, all right, it looks like Catherine Z. I'm going to unmute you and Go ahead and ask your question. All right, for the first step, when you're sewing around the circle, would you, if you did not have a clear foot, would like a zigzag stitch foot work for that? Uh, yes, the, the reason I like the open toe and the clear foot is just so that I can really see that um, stitching line. But if you have another foot, if you don't have an open toe or a decorative stitch foot, as long as you can see the line, that's what counts. So you might want to take your time a little bit more because it might not be quite as visible, but um, you can definitely do it with that, sure. You can do it with the standard foot as well. All right, great. We have a question from Carolyn's iPhone. Let me, um, oops, I just remuted you. I thought I ignored it. Okay. <laughs> You're 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 there, Carolyn. Okay, I sorry if I missed it, but is this technique? Can you, you do it on a knit as well as a woven? Yes, I've done it on tons of knits, um, oh, great. and it's it's easy. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, it works great on them. And the other thing is also uh, while I'm thinking about knits and this technique, is that you can definitely do it with the interfacing to have a finished edge, but you can do it and leave the um, edge of the circle raw on a knit too, if you wanted a little bit more of kind of a boho look to it, um, <laughs> you can do that as well. And it's, it's really cute. So it's yeah, definitely. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. But, you know, I will say, um, on some knits, if they're very stretchy, um, again, you don't, I, I think rayon knits tend to have a little bit of sheerness or transparency to them. So you might want to test it on scrap fabric. And I would test anything on my scrap fabric first, just to get your settings right on your machine. And just to do a little warm up practice for yourself as well. But um, you want to test um, to see on the knits to make sure you don't get any distortion. And if you did, that might be a time when I would put a little piece of fusible interfacing in back of the fabric first, then do the interfacing on top and do your window technique just to um, keep it from getting distorted. All right, we have a question, it looks like, from Joanne B. Uh, I did not get her unmuted. There we go, Joanne. Hi, how is everybody? Hi, Joanne. Good to, good to see this tonight. It's nice to be in a, in a neighborhood group meeting. Um, well, thank you for joining. Yeah, thank you for doing this. Gail, I was just wondering, um, these uh, garments obviously look a little bit on the delicate side with the linen and with the embellishments. Do you have these dry cleaned? Um, most of the time, that jacket with the crystals on it, I would dry clean that, yes. But um, most of the other things, believe it or not, if you turn them inside out and button them up or snap them, whatever you have on for closures, 
and you can put it either on the gentle cycle or a hand wash cycle, then let it air dry. I think it should be okay. But it, that also depends on if you pre-wash your fabric before you've cut it out too. All right, and it looks like we have another question from uh, Laura. I'm working on unmuting you, Laura. It seems to be, okay, there you go, Laura, you're on. Uh, so I was wondering, Gail, when you put this on a garment, do you do something on the inside so that the interfacing is not visible on the interior of the garment? Um, well, on that black jacket that had the crystals on it, that was lined. But most of the time, if I'm doing it on a very casual jacket, as long as it looks neat and tidy on the inside, really, how many people are really going to see it? Not, not very many. And of course, our sewing friends always would because we're always great for um, when somebody says they made something, we always open it up and look at it and all of that. But um, uh, it doesn't bother me as long as it's done neatly on the inside. All right. Um, we have a question from Marie. Oops, I can't hear anything. There we go. Sorry, I, un I muted myself instead of unmuting Marie. <laughs> so <laughs> that was my bad. Um, You're doing great. You're doing great. <laughs> Um, working on unmuting Marie, and I'm having a little trouble. Come on, let me unmute Marie. Marie, I'm trying to unmute you. I apologize for whatever is. Well, for the life of me, Marie, I there you go. You were unmuted. Yay. Hi. Hi, Marie. Uh, Marie Scharf from Connecticut. Hi, uh, Marie Scharf. How are you? How, I'm fine. Thank you, Gail. Uh, listen, uh, the, the fusible that you're using, is it a Trico iron-on? No, it's my Denny Fuse interfacing that I sell on my website. It's a woven um, micro denier polyester interfacing. It's, it's, I use it on tons of fabrics and garments all the time. I love it but it's woven. You could use a Trico if you wanted to, if you have one that you like, you could definitely use it. Again, anytime you're going to do a new technique or try something new, I always try it out on scrap fabric first, just to make sure that I like all of the components. Does the interfacing work well? Um, is my stitch length good, tension, um, all, all of those things, but definitely do it on some scrap fabric to make sure you like it. But yes, you could do it with a Trico, definitely, a fusible Trico. All right, and we have uh, one more question, it looks like, from uh, Terry. And so let's see if I can get Terry unmuted. All right, Terry. Hi, Gail. How do you apply Hi, your applique, reverse applique fabric? I don't think you mentioned how to do that. Oh, with that, um, if we're looking at um, the screen, can you still see my, my um, window with the yeah. fabric back. Okay, what I usually do is I um, usually do a straight stitch around, but um, just to make it look kind of fun, it depends on what the garment is, but um, most of the time I like something that's kind of bold. I might um, stitch around uh, multiple times. I might do say three or five lines of stitching around, but you have to be kind of careful to try to make sure that they're pretty even um, going around. But I most of the time use a straight stitch, but if you wanted to try a zigzag with some um, decorative thread, say with a, um, uh, a 30 weight, and you, if it doesn't work well in your needle eye, you can always put it in a top stitch needle. And the heavier weight decorative threads are kind of nice because they are bold and um, they give a great look to the fabric. Okay, we have another question. We've got a question from Joy Bostic. Uh, I'm working on unmuting you. Hi, Joy from Atlanta. I know you. 
Yep, she's not quite unmuted yet. My skills in unmuting seem to be, here we go. All right, Gail. Joy. There you go. Hey, Gail. Uh, sorry, I can't show myself right now. I look a mess. But <laughs> wanted to know a couple of things. One, is this a technique that you can use with like embroidery uh, floss? And then how would you use this technique if you wanted to uh, have a functioning button? Okay. Um, well, when, Joy, when you say the embroidery floss, what did you have in mind for that? For stitching around the perimeter? Or... Oh, yes. Okay. Um, if you can, if your uh, machine will do it, or were you planning to do it by hand? Oh, I hate handwork, but I'm just curious as to what the, the options are. Yeah, if your machine, you probably want to put in a top stitch needle. And I think most embroidery flosses, are they about six or eight fibers that are put together? I think it's usually about six, maybe. Yeah, about six. Um, I, I might take out um, a couple of those, but you could try it with a top stitch needle. You might have to fuss around, though, with your um, tension um i with your bobbin too to get that but that would be something you could play with on your scrap fabric joy all right we've got three more questions and that's about how much time we have left so i've got one from looks like susie brown and i'm gonna unmute susie um Let me try that again. Okay. Well, it seems like such a simple task. I think you're doing fantastic managing hundreds of people. Well, I would feel so much better if I could unmute Susie um, to get her question. Let me try this again. It is just not. I wonder if a lot of people are Zooming because it's Father's Day. Maybe, I wonder if that might be interfering with something. Um, I don't know, but I, for the life of me, I cannot seem to unmute Susie. And so, Susie, I, I absolutely apologize, but for some reason, I cannot unmute you. I have, I just did it. All right, Susie. Hey. Okay. Hi, Gail. This is Susie from Alameda County Chapter in California. How are you? I'm great, Susie Burden Brown. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. I was just wondering, um, I've always wanted to, I always envisioned putting this on um, the bottom of a skirt. Oh, absolutely. What is your opinion on that? Absolutely. Um, let me just do that screen share. I'm going to um, take this off for just a second. I think I am. Oh, you, I can't, can you, uh, you disabled me from screen sharing? Oh, you know what? Let me, um, I did because we had a, uh, an odd thing pop in. So, okay. all right. You have permission again. Okay. So let me just hit this. And I think I may have to cancel the spotlight of your video. Okay. Susie, that's the bottom of a skirt. Oh, okay. okay. I did that stepped hem on that, um, it, and that's a faced hem. So, and actually, because I have the window, the facing kind of, let me see if I can, I had to scoop it down so that it wouldn't peek through. I had to make oh, it very yeah. narrow. But it's beautiful on the hem of a skirt. It's very eye-catching and nice. So, yes, that's absolutely. That's your... Say it again. Um, it, I, I, uh, I cannot, I, I act, I was trying to tap something else and I muted her again and now I can't okay. unmute her again. So, ah, all right. I am sorry. I cannot get Susie unmuted again. So I think maybe hopefully you've been able to answer most of her question. Okay. I just um, want to see one ah. other no, I think all right. Off. Okay. Okay. Let, let me. Sharing. All right. Let me. Uh, we have another question 
we've got enough time for like maybe one more question. So uh, let me unmute Karen, hopefully. And okay, Karen, you're unmuted. Hi, I'm Karen from the Chicago chapter. Hi, Karen. It's assuming, hello, assuming from you're using the fusible, you talked about the Demi. Um, is there sort of a maximum size of the openings you can do before you start risking deforming the shape? Um, well, it depends on what you're going to do it on. Were you thinking about doing it on a garment? Yes, on a garment, on linen, actually kind of like you're talking around the hem of a skirt or a dress or something like that. Um, I, I wouldn't would want say... it to be bored stiff. <laughs> <laughs> no, the the fusible interfacing that I use is lightweight and it never it really just gives the uh, fabric nice body without making it stiff at all. I've used it. I'll fuse garments 100%. Like I have a silk um, counterpoints jacket, a red silk one that I completely fuse the whole body and I've done it on lots of them, but no, they're never stiff. They're, they're really super nice actually. Okay. But could you do like a three inch round circle? I don't see or, why not. Again, I would okay. try it on your scrap fabric, but I don't see why you couldn't because um, as I said, with that one, two, three number, this is the smallest window of those three that I do. The oh, biggest okay. one is probably, actually it is, it's probably about two and a half inches wide. So yes, you could definitely do a three inch window. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So I, uh, I know that there's probably more, I know that there are more questions in the waiting area, but we are very near, we're three minutes away from the end of our hour. So I want to, um, first of all, Gail, I want to say thank you so much for doing this for us. It has been just a real treat. I'm going to cancel spotlight here. So, that, but, um, and let's see, I don't want this to be on just me. Um, all Am right. Again? Okay. There, let's see, here we go. There we go. All right. So um, I wanted to, first of all, just say thank you again so much. This has been a treat. Um, I want to say thank you to all of the, at one I think the highest number I saw was 607 of you out there wow. in the audience. Thank, thank you, you so much for joining. Um, we had no idea, since, especially since this was on Father's Day evening, if we would have uh, very many people, but we really wanted to give this a shot. We really wanted to give it a try. And we really wanted to give it a try before we got into the virtual conference um, sessions that will be coming up the week that conference would have been in San Antonio. So I personally want to say thank you for coming. And I personally want to say thank you for your patience with some of our technical things that like no chat when I told you that's the only way to ask a question. We're, we've got things to learn and we're going to continue learning. And uh, we're just grateful that we're in a community that's willing to try new things with us and uh, bump along the way as we learn how to do it a little bit better. So um, please uh, feel free to uh, send us emails about uh, ideas or thoughts or um, just anything that uh, you think might help us make this the best possible experience. We're hoping to be able to maybe do this about once a month, maybe. And uh, we hope to have them in the, on the website for one week. Um, oh, uh, Gail, the, the yes. door prize. Oh, yes. Um, really my embellishment book, I sold out through two printings of my It's All About Embellishment book, but I turned it into an ebook. And so one lucky winner tonight who's still on is going to win um, that book. But also I made that, uh, whoops. Okay. Uh, let me, let me, <laughs> I don't. I'll talk it through it. Anyway, um, I also have the book on sale for 10% off 
um, until next Sunday, till the 28th. So um, the book is only $10 normally. So it's a dollar, it's $9 now. So you can download that and um, have all of these embellishment techniques. There's twin needling, there's the um, reverse applique, the window technique, um, a lot of different techniques in there. So um, it's a nice buy. You can go onto my website, gailpatrice.com, into the store and download that. With and oh, and the coupon code for that is ASG SOS. A S G S E W S, all caps. So and you can find that in the members only section under special offers if you forget. Yes, so, so um, that's on sale for a week. So take advantage of it. And um, if anyone has any questions that they want to send along, if um, we couldn't unmute you or we ran out of time, you can send them to me, gail at gailpatrice.com in email, and I'll get back to you as quickly as possible. And um, the, the door prize goes to Peggy Norton. Peggy Norton. Right. Uh, so with that, I think that's everything. And um, so we'll say thank you again very much to Gail and thank you to all of you that came. And a very happy Sunday evening to everyone. I know, and I miss all of you without our national conference this year. So I hope I get to see you next summer. Yes, we hope so too. Thanks, Thanks and bye everybody. everybody. Bye-bye.